Good afternoon again. Don't let me interrupt your chewing while you enjoy your lunch. But as we noted, we're going to invite Pat Wood up as our lunchtime keynote speaker. And so I have the privilege of offering a brief introduction of Pat, who most all of you likely know. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. So I will try to do Pat justice in, in my brief introduction. So um, Pat's no stranger to virtually all of you, I think, probably here today because of his deep experience in wholesale and retail market development. I've known Pat since I was the chair of the Ohio Public Utilities Commission, where Pat's generosity and kindness helped me as a new chairman to think through issues, to come and testify at PUCO proceedings on his own time and dime, which I am still grateful for, and sometimes to remind me to keep our eyes on the horizon and not on the day-to-day -day tumult that you experience when you're trying to work through difficult issues at the commission. Pat serves as president of the Hunt Energy Network, an energy storage development company since February of 2019, and as principal of Wood 3 Resources and Energy Infrastructure Developer since July of 2005. Pat is active in the development of electric power and natural gas infrastructure assets in North America. What he may best be known for is from 2001 to 2005, Pat served as chairman of the FERC, and from 95 to 2001, he chaired the Public Utilities Commission of Texas, where he was instrumental in bringing electric competition to the state. I know you all listened to the EPSA podcast where Pat kind of talked about how that came about, and we're grateful for your listening. If you want to go back for a second bite or maybe missed it the first go around, uh, Pat tells a terrific story about how that happened. He currently serves as a director of Quanta Services, Inc. He is a past board chairman of Dynagy, which is now part of Vistra, a past director of Memorial Resource Development and TPI Composites, is also a former director of the American Council on Renewable Energy and a member of the National Petroleum Council. And with that, I will turn it over to Pat. I forgot about doing PUCO on my own dime. That's, the, that's what Mrs. Wood says. She, we love Ohio. My great grand, my grandfather was born in Ohio, so I remember using that testifying at the Ohio legislature. And, and you know, it is cred to have some roots here. I'm honored to be back in my hometown of two tours of duty uh, here in Washington. And it's, it's wonderful to actually be in 3D with so many people and friends again. So thank you for inviting me that many months ago, Todd, to, to come up here. Um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an important time. I mean, 25 years of this institution just forced me to think through what's happened in these 25 years. And um, as I look out on the scene today, and you know, certainly this is kind of ground zero of all the great places in the world where big things happen, but you know, the, the march to freedom has taken a pause. Um, not just in the, in the rollout of uh, tanks and munition lines, which are fortunately on the level of efficiency that even our most chastened utility would never ascribe to, but uh, thank God that Russia is inefficient. Um, but that has been a, a story of both heroism and peril for all of us, and um, it really kind of brings home to me how important it is to not only say you're for liberty, but to fight for it. And so not to over aggrandize our role in, in this room and in this industry, but we've got to also fight for freedom and the continued demonopolization of this important industry to America's future, which is the power industry. We've got to liberate the innovative power of our country's inventors, scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs. There's a broader acceptance, which we just heard about on this lovely last panel, that we need to decarbonize our economy. And that economy is at the same time becoming more electrified with each passing day and each new invention. I, for one, don't think that the future that is that important should be focused and centered in only the most risk averse and conservative industry of our nation's economy. I do think that the state regulated and locally regulated monopolies have served a great role in bringing America to where we are today. But I think that the role going forward needs to be much more than just starring that cast. I think that the middle ground we've taken in the past 25 years is an optimal one. 
unbundling the non-monopolistic features of our power, uh, of our power system uh, for that innovation and efficiency, um, which would be supply, generation supply, and power sales, power demand, while recognizing that at least for now, the delivery of power, the product that moves at the speed of light, we should remember, is actually still a natural monopoly and needs to operate in a reliability-focused, open-source manner. So let's recall what got us here. For me personally, it was a visit, as I recounted with Todd, with uh, our newly elected Governor George W. Bush, who told me, yes, better price. I said, Governor, why, why competition? Why do you want to do this in the power and the telecom industry? Yes, better prices. Yes, better service. Yes, technological innovation. Of course, at that time, this was 95, so these weren't even invented yet. But we all saw where that was going. But he said, more importantly, the problem is, Pat, the utilities care more about what we think in the government, because that's the way it's set up. He pointed to the House and the Senate, and his desk was right in the middle of the Capitol. More than what their customers think, and that's wrong, and we're going to change that. So as a son of a small businessman, uh, my dad ran my great-grandmother's drug stores, which became labeled Patwood Drug Stores in Port Arthur and Groves, Texas. Um, a customer-centered revolution was just right down my fairway. So that's it. The customer the liberty for that customer to choose, and that the role of the government, to me, it, as a Reagan Republican uh, incubated person uh, in the 80s, I uh, definitely believe that the role of government should be limited to those important things that cannot be achieved by people and businesses on their own. Power and generation and power sales can be, and for now, power delivery cannot be. So in doing this, we had to undo a century of vertical integration. Customer protection in those years, in the beginning of the day, became monopoly protection, and so that becomes a bit more of a challenge to undo that. I would say with the 1992 Energy Policy Act, with Order 888, the simultaneous movements within Texas to effectively mirror Order 888, um, led to an independent grid operation and expansion. I'm always so proud to see folks like Gordon and Manu and all their compadres that lead these independent grids, how, how far it's come in just that period of time. I, I couldn't do a full speech on that, but I'll just leave it to say good, good on you. Open access to non-utilities for new builds, for trading. These were small customer, wholesale customer benefits that you know, co-ops and munis, particularly across the country, that were experiencing uh, vertical integration problems in, in doing their wholesale business became a problem. Some states, such as my own home state, went all the way and eliminated the retail franchise as well uh, so that retail, small retail customers could benefit in the way that the small wholesale customers were already benefiting. And an important sequencing thing that Bush reminded me when I was offered the job was, Pat, competition first and then deregulation. And that's kind of a message I had to give to some of my folks on the right side of the agenda more often than not. And um, there is a role for government. Uh, I have been at that cross, cross lines between the business side and the government side for most of my career. And I, I'm comfortable with that. And I think a, lot, a number of us have a discomfort with it, but I think, um, as I'll say at the end of the speech again, we are a commodity like no other, affected with the public interest. Our foundation of our life, not just our economy, but of our life, depends on this commodity that keeps that at 60 hertz all the time. So that's okay, that government is involved there in overseeing this foundational business. In my regulatory role in uh, those 10 years, there was a three-legged stool that was on my poster board for those of you that ever came in my offices during those days of the the three requirements for making markets work, robust infrastructure, balanced market rules, and when I hear balance, I mean balance between investors and customers, and vigilant oversight. And where we've messed up, it's where one of those three has been gone. And there are three outcomes that we look for. We want it cheap, we want it now clean, and we want it reliable. Um, that's one that Clearly, we've, uh, we definitely, I would say that's the report card all the time. 
Texas was doing great on cheap and clean and reliable until last February, and boy, did we get a black eye. So the, it, it's never a job you can sit back and say, it's finished, it's done, check the box, we're moving on. Those are foundational, and that will exist for a century to come. Sequencing is important, and I've given a lot of thought to that lately, and I'm particularly in light of the last panel, I want to just flesh out some thoughts that now as I'm part of a broader, um, I'm at Hunt, at Hunt Energy, part of a larger energy company that deals with things other than power, I'm really mindful of the supply chain issues. They were exacerbated by COVID and, um, and by certainly the Ukraine war, but existed before that. And the supply chain has got to be fixed before we continue the march to decarbonization. We haven't talked about that at all yet today, and I want to throw it out there. Um, today's state affairs is, for me, perilous. Um, we are running away from what we have plenty of in the U.S., which is coal, gas, and oil, for a good reason, as we just talked about. But we are falling into the arms of Russia and China, as we do. They today make the vast majority of the world's enriched uranium, rare earths, batteries, soap, which I'm trying to buy, love to buy it from somebody other than China, solar panels, and even, I think, right about 50% of the world's wind turbines. So that compels us to move this issue, this equipment and technology supply diversity issue, up to the top of our agenda. And as supply chain comes before decarbonization, decarbonization should come before electrification. Efficiency sh was not sacrificed on the altar as we kind of changed religions and moved on. In 1960, in Texas, for example, 90% of us would heat our homes with X amount MMBTUs of natural gas to stay warm in the winter. Now 60 plus percent of Texans, and I'm sure the number is similar across the country, are using twice as much, mostly natural gas, to heat their homes in the winter because we've electrified heating for the home. Now that doesn't really have a great carbon benefit in my estimation, I don't know how your math works, but we saw the fatal and unfortunate consequences of this in my home state last February. So let us please collectively, those of you particularly in this city who set the expectations for the public and the policymakers, be much more realistic about the sequencing of how this should work. A few other things about the present. The capacity market debate. And I love hearing these because I sit back in the back and remember because I was at the beginning of these. In 03, Gordon remembered, reminded me last night about uh, calling him up and saying, we got to get this done. Let's get it across the, the finish line and get it over with. And then PJM was doing it at the same time as well. I always viewed that these capacity markets were effectively, effectively a substitute for a poorly operating retail competitive market. And so I would kind of roll my eyes and thought, you know, gosh, you really didn't separate out the default provider like, we sh like you should have, like we did back home. And, you know, I, I kind of learned after a few months, you don't keep comparing things to Texas when you're living in D.C. So I, my staff did finally win that debate after a while. But I, in the back of my mind, I knew that we had to do these capacity markets really as the second best option to really full liquidity and full cost responsibility. So. We approved the ISO New England ones, PJM, and a very different one in New York as it was brought to us because we did not have the authority to order a capacity market. I did, thanks to Dick O'Neill and Cindy Marlett, have in my back pocket the ORDC as something that I could order if we needed it for reliability. So I was exposed to that wonderful tool, which I highly endorse. I don't know where they are standing in, in, the, in the queue of utility reforms to this day, because I'm not as informed on the outside of ERCOT stuff going on as you all are, but ORDC was an uh, ancillary service that we could actually order through FERC and uh, to address reliability concerns. But the ability to integrate demand and supply within a company portfolio is only just now starting to be refined. And as our Texas companies learned, the cost for not being ready are far greater than the cost you have to incur to be ready. And you heard about that from both Thad and, and Kurt earlier today. Other thoughts about the present. Um, we did, both at Texas and at the, at the FERC, bet on the big grid and the small grid, laying down the groundwork for not only standardization of rules across the power system at transmission level, but also at distribution. And I'm really proud of FERC that 
in a bipartisan manner acted, uh, I guess a year or two ago, with Order 2222 to really give some contour and some integration ability of uh, the distributed resources that we know are a big part of the future. Storage was a tool that I did not have in 1999 and in 2002 when we were doing market reforms at the state and federal level. It is transformative. You know, we got a product that moves at the speed of light. Um, I was analogizing it to the product that moves at about 30 miles an hour in the gas pipeline system. And I remember being involved as a staffer in the unbundling of the natural gas business back in uh, the all day era um, in order 636 that uh, storage is a just phenomenally uh, useful commodity to bring efficiency to markets and to bring reliability to the customers. And so, you know, part of that can be exported to the power system. Uh, I would love to have the, uh, the duration of a storage cavern to work on uh, electricity as opposed to the one hours to maybe four hours max that we have today. But I'll take what we can get. Um, I'm rolling those out in my day job uh, to substations uh, across Texas. I've learned that coming from the swamp side of Texas in Port Arthur, there are some really but ugly parts of Texas that I thought refineries, <laughs> um, but I've got some batteries there that are making them really pretty and keeping that power factor a lot closer to 1.0 than they ever were with all that oil field load. But good Lord have mercy, it is a big state. Um, Storage is crucial. It'll be a part of the mix going forward. It's fun to be in it. Um, I know a number of you have, um, have touched it and some of you are deep into it, but it is, it is that tool. The, the market readers, market design of my era would have been so much easier had we had the ability of storage. Uh, all the independent market monitors and the market mitigation and all those things would look so much different if you had the ability to really you know, not be into the price, uh, have more price responsive demand than just turn it on, turn it off, supply driven world that we were making rules for. So it's fun. Speaking of gas, I do have to observe a positive thing about, um, and there's not many, about the situation in Ukraine um, that I saw coming out of our president, President Biden last week, or earlier, what, what, what day is it? Yeah, it's Monday, last week. When, um, when he and the head of the, EU, uh, the European Union committed to a supply of LNG to Europe in a major sustainable way, combined at the same time, I think independently, I would assume, with the adjustment by FERC to its uh, natural gas pipeline policy and how that should be viewed and treated. Um, I think that provides for all of us, and, I'll, and I heard, heard shades of it earlier today, as a, as a welcome pivot to a more all of the above approach that we all know is the truth, that we're gonna need to make the transition. I mean, I was sitting next to a gentleman who did the math on the 150 trillion divided by 325 million people um, over 25 years, that's 1,500 bucks a person a month. I, I think we've got to agree and we've got to help our fellow citizens of this country understand that while we know we need to get there, it's gonna take some time and it's not gonna play out like everybody on either side says, you know, the, the hydrocarbon folks know not never a century away. You know, the folks on the other end are saying tomorrow, we, it's really got to be managed in a way that keeps everybody at the table so we can not talk about talking points and bumper stickers, but have solutions that work in the middle. And I, so I do think that that pivot last week, um, particularly at the presidential level, because he is the leader of our country, uh, can really provide that welcome space for us to talk about the solutions and the timetables and the length of that bridge. Is it a, a hop over the pond or a causeway? It's somewhere in between. So at EPSA 50 in 2047, when I'll be about the age my dear father and grandfather went to, to the great beyond, what's our power sector gonna look like? And what are we doing to get ready for it? Well, for one thing, my first bet is that it will be the Electric Power and Demand Supply Association, Electric Power Supply and Demand, sorry about that, I put it in the wrong place, because we'll finally, in those 25 years, learn how to finally commoditize demand side. I mean, maybe 2222 will help that get there, but 
I'm out there trying to do it, and I think others will be as well, and we're going to finally figure out how to do it. Um, it will be a much, much more electrified world overall, both in width in terms of more people. Third world gets up to, you know, not living in substandard conditions, but like, like the rest of us and in depth in the penetration to the overall economy. Transport, to be sure, um, but also many commercial and industrial uses that have not yet been converted to electricity, which again, as I said earlier, need to be done in the right sequence, because we don't want to do them so fast that we don't have the decarbonized grid to work on it. And I think perhaps the overall trend to um, a warmer climate may actually ameliorate that use of gas to keep homes warm, but um, I tell you, that was damn cold February 15th of 2021 in Houston, Texas. I couldn't even walk to my mailbox, which is about as far as I am to Deborah, uh, without falling on, you know, half inch of ice and being in the hospital, which I couldn't get to anyway. So I stayed on the, <laughs> I stayed on the front door and uh, the, old, the old look out the front door and boxers doesn't work when it's about 12 degrees in Houston, I can tell you. Um, this all implies a retooling of the distribution system, so let's look at the regulated side for a minute. Um, I'm on the board of Quanta Services, and w the CEO there has made it real clear to the board that we've got to make sure we have the labor force and the, and the, 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 the tools to help the regulated utilities get ready for the increase of home charging, for one example. We've got, I think, our sixth and seventh Tesla on the street where I live, and I've noticed at nighttime now, my 40 amp circuit goes down to 30. And it has a little note there, due to, to, due to neighborhood, due to, due to local grid conditions. So Tesla's, that's much of a snoop that they can tell you uh, why, your, why your rating's going down. But that makes, it's very consistent with what my CEO warned me two years ago, that the distribution systems of America for just this one usage, and that's a big usage, and it'll be one that'll kind of grow over time, but I'll tell you, as a Texan, when the Ford F-150 comes out, that party's over. I think all, all the people who say it's going to be slow, it's going to be slow, I'm like, mm, mm There's not a Bubba in Houston, Texas that ain't dying to have one of those cars. It's, and then when you have that car be able to be a two-way charger back to the house so that you don't have, you know, the people who were out for 36 or 72 hours last year in Texas, they're suddenly uh, kind of demand responsive customers that look a lot like a large industrial on the Houston Ship Channel. So I think the transformation is going to be a lot of fun to watch, but we do need a enhanced, and I'll use the word for, I know those of you who hate it, but I'm, I'm, I straddle the, the utility and the non-utility world, grid modernization. It is, if it's really modernization, it's going to cost some money and it's going to have to accomplish that purpose. I think further expansion of the transmission system. Y'all know that one of my heroes is the man who worked for me, Rob Gramlich, is doing such a great job really articulating a lot of these discussions, as are so many. I mean, I just, Rob's just one of my favorite people, but as you think about the things that need to happen across the country and, and to make it all come together better and to really optimize the uses of our rich renewable resources that are in the Sun Belt and in the Wind Belt, but not so many here in the population belt, so we got to kind of move those things around. Speaking of belts, after lunch, thank you, Todd. Um, so that's got to be hardened and modernized, but two-way, because the prosumer is here. I, uh, I have solar panels and a battery on my house. Uh, I'm a member of SunPower's board. Uh, actually, I'd step off uh, on Thursdays, my last day on that board from IPO, but um, I put the product on my roof and then never look back. So I'm a, I'm a fan of that stuff. I do like being able to reduce my demand off the, the system in the middle of the day. It makes me feel like I'm helping my fellow Texans and Americans make it all better. But eventually, I think all this, uh, the wires business gets probably deregulated similar to what gas has done and maybe even as far as what oil pipelines do. I think at the end of the day, it'll be, um, you know, an open source system that is completely uh, quarantined from the competitive products. We aren't quite there yet, but um, it becomes fully quarantined from generation everywhere, I think, uh, and, and from retail and sales and, and marketing in many more places than today. Our generation, of course, is a lot more wind and solar, uh, driven by raw economics. Hopefully, and the subsidies will be put to bed. I don't think we need them anymore. I know that's politically popular in this city, but I'll tell you out there in the sticks, 
uh, they win either way. Um, if you've got the resource, you don't really need to, to subsidize it. In the places where you don't have the resource, then I think RPSs and things like that are going to continue to be part of the system. But I will just admit, uh, when fan that I am, the PTC is very distortive to an energy market. And so um, while it didn't cause the February problem, it could in the future, just as we go from 30 gigs. And my God, I thought I was such a hero when we put 2,000 megawatts in our statute. Now it's 30. Um, but it's you know projected to go to 56 in solar in Texas, going from you know eight nine today to 25 by in two and a half years. Uh, just kind of hard to imagine how those numbers all work. Um, I think so. Geothermal, we punch a lot of holes in this planet. Um, is there a way we can make money out of that too? Uh, I know there are a lot of people in Texas trying to figure that out, and I assume all the other states are similarly economically driven. I think after the fiascos by the regulated monopolies in the southeast that used billions of captive ratepayer and taxpayer monies to uh, not figure out nuclear and carbon capture, uh, that the competitive sector will have workable solutions for these two things that are very important uh, as we pivot, you know, again, su supply chain issues on uranium, uh, to be sure, fixed by that time. But the competitive power sector can make small nukes. My SPAC today is uh, uh, teamed up with um, a, a public announced partner, New Scale, which is making SMRs. Decarbonization of fossil fuels. <sighs> Been waiting for that. Um, I think that the tax credit that came out in the 2017 tax reform, I've seen a lot of people in my hometown and I'm sure across the country as well move that ball a lot farther than I thought it would be. So I'm cautiously optimistic on carbon uh, sequestration and I'm, I'm hopeful because I, I do think really at the end of the day um, we're going to move to a world that's flush with renewable energy. Energy market pricing is going to go to zero in most hours and crisply defined ancillary services and or capacity requirements which despite what my FERC lawyers told me in the day I think are really just birds of the same feather. Uh, those will really be the bulk of revenues for power suppliers in the days going forward. That's true for demand programs as well. I think that the more fixed nature of such payments will cause those customers who can and who are allowed to, to adjust their behavior in order to avoid them. We call that arbitrage. Um, much as the large industrials that ERCOT have done for years in managing their supply, their demand for those peak four days of June, July, August, and September to avoid paying the transmission charges of ERCOT, um, which we, we made that decision uh, with foresight. I think as we, as we move on from that, um, we'll get to that next holy grail. I thought that really storage and demand response were the true holy grail, but the true holy grail, I think now, moving the, moving the, the finish line, is gradations in power quality according to customer preferences. I sit there, I had a gas backup generator, solar and wind and solar and battery at my, on my house. I didn't need my power to come on. And if I could have kept that power off for two more days to save a Houstonian from dying, I would have done that deal in a heartbeat without even thinking about it. And I know a lot of other people would too. But as we get to that world, um, that ability to, to really adjust power quality with more devices that allow us to, to gate that on and off. And I think of our large investment that we made in smart meters. Uh, it does a great job reading your meter every month without having to do a truck roll, but didn't do much to save people's lives when the power was out. That's changing. Our commission is on top of that, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to that day. But as a fallout from that will be that ability to give customers more choices about what they do and to give them a price benefit if they choose to have a lesser grade service so that uh, we don't have to do what we do for drinking water. All of this is drinkable and your water system that brings it to your house, hopefully yours is drinkable at your house too, but how much of that is used for your drinking and your cooking? About 12%. The rest is water in your yard, water in your car, um, flushing down the potty or down down the sink, 
Um, but yet we designed that water system to be 99.9% pure, and we do our power system the same way. Is that really the efficient way to do it? So I think that that comes forth in the demand revolution that we've got going forward. As a side note, I would like to look uh, and mention resource-rich Texas as a place where I think all this comes to play first, maybe even ahead of California. And, you know, those of y'all that know me, you know, we always were kind of excited to learn from everybody else. And my favorite line from the old days was, um, pioneers get shot and settlers get the land. So I was really happy to be in, in you know, electric policy making both in Texas and at the federal level, more of a settler, learning from other people's mistakes. But we're kind of at the point now back home where we don't have a lot of models to look at as to how to get this done right. The flood of solar and wind is continuing unabated, as is load growth and large industrial relocations to Texas. And again, as I mentioned for broadly, I think by 2035, 80% of our energy hours will be at zero. Energy price in an energy only market clearing at zero, 80% of the time. That means the other 20% of the hours, the hot summers and the cold winters, we're jagged as hell and spiky and uh, very volatile. If our pricing structures are inadequate to keep the power on during those cold winters and hot summers, they have to be revised. And they are the, our current commission is looking at that, as I know other thinkers are looking across the country. But they've got a statutory obligation to, to do that. Even though that wasn't really an issue in the February freeze, the Texas legislature can sometimes surprise you, and they came out with this one that said, do this provision looking forward to uh, a future where we've got dispatchable generation and that we have the ability to pay for it so that we get the timely investments long before we need them. Well, from the perspective of looking out that front door when, uh, uh, when I wasn't in my boxers on the President's Day last year, it became evident to me that while, again, renewables didn't cause that outage, they could in the future. So I would consider, and I propose, I know it's not welcome in some of my friends' uh, cocktail parties, that an 80% decarbonized grid is the A+. Plus. I think we've got to think that the climate report card, while very important, and I'm, I'm committed to it, I think I need to bring some more of my Republican friends along, but we've got to keep those gas plants, including the new ones that Kurt said won't get built. Uh, we've got to keep them running, and we've got to get the new ones built, albeit for much fewer hours of the year than they are today. And that's tough for combined cycles like THADs that were built to run 60 to 80 percent of the hours of the year having them run 20 to 40 is a, is a big change. But I think customers in New England, just like the ones in Texas and across the country, want the power to work first and foremost. I heard somebody say, in the dark, you can't tell green from brown. So grid operators in the future, I think, will be, and I, I like to think now that I've finally learned what they do, after all these years of being your friends, where are you, Gordon? I know you're over, there you are. Um, they're huge IT managers. That's what they really are with the weather forecasting unit attached to them. They have great big responsibilities in all of the above. In the future, they will continue to coordinate, but I think they will coordinate the reliable dispatch of maybe a great diversity of mostly privately run managed portfolios of matched supply and demand. Those get brought to the market, those get managed, much as supply portfolios have been done in the past. The region-wide the region -wide grid expansion uh, across the country and, and within the RTOs will continue to integrate more broadly across the nation. So in other words, those seams issues that I thought would be resolved by now um, will have to because those rich resources from the sun and the wind belt uh, are needed to really solve the issues of the whole country. There will be myriad opportunities for power demand management as the industry finally figures out how to make money off of it, and storages, smart appliances, distributed generation, solar rooftop. I'm, I'm not really good at the crystal ball game. There'll be 10 more things that I should have added after that last comma that, that I don't know, but those things are finally, I think, here. It's the time. And as we're, uh, as we're learning from across the ocean, um, liberty has to be defended and earned every single day. Complacency on any of the big three tools, robust infrastructure, balanced market rules, and vigilant oversight, or on any of the big three outcomes, clean, cheap, and reliable, they lead to bad outcomes. There are the debates of the day, I've heard them today, Moper, 
the duck curve, or of course, if you're in Texas, it's the armadillo curve because we have to be different. <laughs> Offshore wind, gas pipeline approvals. We always have to keep our focus, despite those issues of the day, this focus has to stay on that North Star, which is the customer. Are we providing innovation, service quality, reliable clean, clean power at a good price? At the end of the day, this is a commodity fully affected by the public interest. I've come to reconcile myself with that, and I hope you do too, because there will always be government engagement in our business. At the end of the day, I've come to the conclusion that this is good because of the foundational commodity when it's our way of life. I'm, again, I looked at Texas being four and a half minutes from black start. And we later found out that half of our black start units were out. Imagine that science fiction series on Netflix. Texas, dark. The U.S. dark. We had that a little bit in 2003, but fortunately the integrated grids of the Northeast picked Ohio back up, put you back in the saddle. We were a little slower with Ontario. Thank God it wasn't a Russia-Ukraine border there, but it's Canada-U.S. and they were friendly and worked with us. But, um, you know, that's, that's a scary scenario, but it is so foundational to not just our economy, but to our way of life, the business that you all and we are in. So we have an obligation to run our businesses like a political campaign, communicating a robust, market-based, innovation-centered, reliable, clean solution vision to our customers every day of the year, every hour of the year, 8760, or 87, somebody told me the other day, 8784, if you're in an election, election presidential year. Um, are we up to this challenge? I think we are. Let's go get it. Todd, 25 more to you, and thank you for inviting me to be here. <laughs>